I'll talk this morning, but let me introduce Auntie, Auntie Killigan, a friend and a wonderful professional. Welcome, welcome, Auntie. So what, what are you going to talk about today? Well, um, first of all, can everybody hear me okay? My screen is showing okay? Everything good? Oh, good. Perfect. Um, so before I get on about what I'm going to uh, be talking about today, um, a big thank you. Uh, Cloud Security Alliance has been a great resource of information for me over the years. So I'm honored to be speaking here today. And um, you mentioned earlier about, you know, getting involved. Um, some of you already know I myself am a member of another security nonprofit. Um, I'm founder and organizer for the Security Besides Dublin Conference. So I appreciate We need more of, of that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> March, Mar March isn't coming soon enough. Uh, you know, pop pop over the water and, and come over to Dublin. We'll have a great time. Uh, but I genuinely appreciate the amount of effort going into these things. Like, I know it takes a lot of evenings. I know it takes weekends to organize something like this. Um, so as a participant, I wanted to thank you and the rest of the chapter board members for organizing this. And I'm sure the day is going to go without a hitch. Uh, like you filled in really well, but when <laughs> you went through your slides very quickly, I was impressed. <laughs> I, I was kind of waiting for a text to come through, Anthony, John Early. Uh, you did a fine job, every one of you. And um, on kind of the same note, like these events don't happen without the work that you, the volunteers are doing. Like, I think a lot of people don't realize that, you know, you have your day jobs and you have your life. And then you also need to, you know, make sure that these, these events happen. Um, you know, you know very well what our job is like, oh, <laughs> because, because we have yeah. a very similar job. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And um, it was actually quite, quite cool to hear from you, Francesco, and from Crete and Vladimir and Shireen, you know, talking about what they're doing and why they got into this, like, you know, basically giving up their free time for, for what is essentially the benefit on others. Um, so those, to, also I, how people got what, what they got out of it. Exactly. Think, yeah. If, <laughs> Actually, if, if, if you if tell to hear about Shireen, Shireen and I used to work in the same company many years ago. And uh, it, it was actually quite cool that her, you know, her career break turned into this in the end. Uh, so some good stuff. And I, I would recommend to everyone watching this, you know, get involved. Like these types of nonprofits, they wouldn't exist without that time that the volunteers put in. Right. And um, what I also wanted to say was that I'm very grateful for the, the late-ish start, like 10 o'clock. Um, I'm not an early riser. And to steal a space <laughs> from one of my colleagues, uh, I am not. I, I am subhuman before ten a.m. So this this That's was where we had coffee. <laughs> right Don't talk me before coffee. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what? Yeah. Uh, but what, what's your background? So who you are? Tell, tell tell the audience a little bit who you are, what you do, and then what you're gonna talk about today. Well, this is all part of my talk, so I'll I'll do I'll do my own intro. <laughs> all right, um, I'll, I'll, then I'll let I leave to it, guys. Everybody, thank you so much for joining, and please welcome on the stage and thank you again. Thank you. Um, I should also mention, and you can probably see from your screen, there is going to be multiple references to Star Wars throughout the talk. So, um, apologies to anyone who's never seen the movies, although. If you haven't seen the movies, I give you permission to not watch this keynote, drop off the call, go start watching the movies. They were just incredible. You have permission, go right now. Um, you need to watch these. So the, the who am I and why I'm here, as I said, I, I was going to answer this anyway. And um, I've, I've asked myself these questions many times over the years. Who am I? Why am I here? And, you know, sometimes I get nothing while other times I have epiphanies about those particular questions. And if you're interested in this type of answer, my social media, uh, the deets are on the screen. So hit me up. i um, have to talk about that. Uh, today, however, I'm not here to discuss the philosophical aspect of the, the who am I and why am I here? So I'll just stick to the facts. Um, my name is Anthony Gilligan. And I'm currently a CISO at Akira, 
and I'm physically located in Ireland, uh, which, believe me, makes playing beach volleyball very challenging. And um, when I say challenging, I mean it literally. Like, we often have impromptu competitions. Who can set up their tent faster than the rest when the rain showers hit mid-game? Um, uh, beach volleyball is what I like to do for fun outside of work. And if you're wondering, you know, do these floating dog heads belong to dogs that I own? Uh, you're, of course, correct. Uh, and they are here for no reason other than that they are my three re rescue archers. Uh, they are three great dogs. And they're here really because the animation really cracked me up when I was playing around with the slides. So I just left it in. Um, and public service announcement to anyone considering adopting lurchers. They call them 40 mile per hour couch potatoes. Uh, so prepare to spend the next few years of your life fighting for space on the sofa. Uh, so going back to what I was saying, um, I am currently a CISO, but um, I spent many years slumming it as a pen tester, as an AppSec engineer, as a DevSecOps engineer, a security architect, and Basically, you name it, I've probably done it. And that's the benefit of being old. You've had the time to try the stuff that you wanted to try. Um, I've always been very curious about how things work in general. Um, it kind of serves a purpose uh, in, in my, my um, you know, quest for efficiency. So when I started working in security, I really, really wanted to learn and understand about all the different um, areas of security. With the exception of forensics, my interest in them was very short-lived. I just never got into it. Uh, but anyway, I'm not here to talk about myself. And if you really want to know more, like like I said, my social media is on screen. So, you know, snoop around, have your fill. Um, and to get back to, you know, back to the serious of why am I here at this conference, um, I'm here to share what I've learned uh, over the last 15 years working in cybersecurity and also to share where I see the future going. And I'm, I'm only going to get that um, till the end. So I'll talk about that a little bit later. So as I mentioned, I had you know loads of different jobs, doing loads of different things for loads of different companies, uh, from startups to large multinationals and also in loads of different sectors, so consultancies and banks and tech companies. And originally, when I started putting this talk together, my, my starting angle was going to be, uh, there is no wrong way doing security. All security is good. But then I started thinking back to all of those different positions that I had and all of those different organizations and how no matter what my job was at the time, people were coming to me for help, which is good. Um, and they were coming to me for help because people in general, they, they tend to want to do the right thing. Like no developer wants to write bad code and no company really wants to sell a bad product to their customers. But then I also started thinking back to all the frustrating situations um, that I've been in over the years. And I came to the realization then that Yes, there is a wrong way of doing security. And a lot of you might be thinking now, like, who is this crazy lady and what is she talking about? Security is great, all hail security. But, you know, just two minutes, hear me out. I once worked in a very large, a very mature organization. And on the surface, the security team were doing all the right things. Like, they were a very large, very well established team they had really good processes in place and you know that all sounds good um you know people were engaged in them at the right time great but that honeymoon period for me ended when i had a developer come to me asking for guidance which okay it's, it's a good thing but it was guidance on one of the security policies that were in place at the company and the issue that he was having at the time and wanted to discuss with me was that the data in the particular part of the application that he was working on were public data. So there was no requirement for protecting its confidentiality. But the security policy mandated that all data 
in that application was to be encrypted. By default, no questions asked. And if you've ever tried to implement encryption, you'll know it can be a major pain in the butt. You know that it's costly operationally to run and that is also slow. So his question was valid. Why was he mandated to encrypt the data? Now, by that stage of my career, it had been, you know, part of my day-to-day -day life explaining to non-security teams why a particular security control is required. I'd been doing that for years. Uh, nothing new there. And security might not be their subject matter expertise, but, you know, typically their technical people understand the specifics um, if you explain to them. And at the end of most of such conversations, they tend to get it and agree. Yes, there is good reason why security are asking me to do something. But in that case, I had absolutely nothing to come back with. Like, what was the rationale behind encryption being a requirement in this case? And the sad truth was, and this is why the honeymoon ended there, there was none. It was a case of being tied to a strict organizational-wide security policy that was probably written first time a long time ago, and quite possibly during a compliance box ticking exercise that we're all very familiar with. And essentially, it was a case of doing security for the sake of security. It served no purpose other than just broaden that gap that typically exists between security teams and other teams in an organization. And that is the wrong way of doing security. No good can ever come of it. And if this is the wrong way, then what's the right way of doing it? Um, security always comes back to risk. And I know that risk is not sexy. I know that most people don't like hearing about it and never mind talking about it. Um, so why am I even mentioning this and risking, pun very much intended, risking people heading off now to grab their coffee. So I mention it because when you get down to it, there's no denying it, risk is at the core of what drives security. And risk assessments are not foolproof. Um, like anyone who's watched Star Wars Episode 4 A New Hope is no stranger to risk prioritization gone wrong. Um, hello, thermal exhaust port. But they serve their purpose most of the time. And that's why companies around the world still use risk assessment as their driver for prioritizing security activities to this day. So I remember starting my first job as an AppSec engineer. And when I say first job, I mean it was a position where AppSec engineering was 100% of my time um, dedicated to AppSec engineering, not just something that was, you know, bits and bobs here and there. Um, AppSec engineering was something that I absolutely loved doing in previous roles. And, you know, there was so much room for improvement at the new job. It was just amazing. Uh, like, I couldn't wait to get started. Like, the possibilities were endless. And then I realized that the possibilities were indeed endless. Now, um, I'm sure a lot of you have seen some version of this AppSec pyramid on the screen, um, AppSec testing. Um, I came across it as part of that new job uh, because the first thing that I needed to do starting there was devising a strategy for improving the security of a new cloud application that was being deployed in the organization. Um, so this pyramid was very useful to me, very helpful, um, especially since back then I didn't even know application vulnerability correlation tools even existed. Like, what is that? My mind was blown. Um, but none of what I saw in this pyramid answered the question that I was asking at the time. What should I do first? And you can see Chewie is thinking about the same question, but you know, he's a Wookiee, so that's not what he's actually saying. Uh, but to get back to it, you know, I was asking that question and there was no amount of Googling that I did that was able to give me a solid guidance. And now I know it was because there is no one size fits all approach to prioritizing an organization security activities. And although every single one of them, and whether it's thread modeling or penetration testing or solution reviews or anything in between, 
it should add value and improve an organization's security posture, there are still ways of defining a prioritized approach that is best suited to address the security risks of that particular organization in an efficient manner. And again, efficiency is something I love, so always striving for it. And what my experience to date has shown, as I mentioned, I've worked in loads of different types of companies, um, is that you know, greenfield organizations and mature organizations are, are not the same. Um, so a greenfield organization like a startup or even when a more mature company starts working on a new product, um, it is typically budget that dictates where you start. And in those cases, a clean slate means no remedial problems. There's no existing fires to fight. Like you start from scratch. And especially if you're a security person that's been hired at the startup, um, you can be pretty damn sure the folks there are security minded already. And, uh, you know, they do a lot of things right to begin with. And, you know, you can start, you know, without weight on your shoulders. You can start with what you can afford or you start with what you need in order to be able to demonstrate compliance for your customers. Now, on the other hand, we have mature organizations and more often than not, um, and I'm sure most of you know this, they carry a significant amount of security specific technical debt. And I should add that it tends to be significant because it's become common practice to deal with the criticals and deal with the highs and you know sweep the rest under the proverbial rug, which is the risk register. Um, but anyway, in a mature organization, you you know you ideally have metrics and they indicate, for example, the organization is drowning in a sea of vulnerable third party libraries or, um, you know, badly written code, or it has a mountain of insecure configurations affecting their cloud environment. And even at an organization that isn't quite so mature to have those metrics, you can still rely on anecdotal evidence being there to indicate that because thankfully security professionals, they tend to be aware of bad practices within their organization, even if they're not documented anywhere. So say you hire an external body um, to come to your organization and conduct a secure code review, and they continuously indicate problems stemming from insecure code, then probably starting application security testing tools is maybe where you want to start. But if you get page after page after page of problems with the security configuration of your cloud environment, well, then you typically end up getting a cloud security posture management tool. And if your pen test reports um, always come back with web application layer findings, then you know you typically invest in a dynamic application security testing tool, um, so on and so forth. Like basically, you tackle the area that causes the most amount of rework on the back of security remediation activities. But say you're at an organization that has implemented a SaaS solution and has implemented the DAST and has implemented the CSPM. It basically, your, your thermal exhaust port concerns have been dealt with. So what next? Um, well, what typically happens next, and I've seen that in every single place I've worked at, is that the security engineering team get bogged down with those same insecure code findings each audit used to show, only now they're a daily occurrence rather than once or twice a year thing. Um, and that same security team, they're also now chasing their tail with the constant flow of alerts from that CSPM because you know, agile development teams on the cloud, they don't deploy once or twice a year. Like those cloud environments can change multiple times a day. So, you know, how is using these tools helping in any way? Now, if you have, take a good look at, at the slides and, um, you know, you look at the types of tools on the slide, you may have noticed a pattern. And if you did, well done. Uh, it's some things already gone wrong. And these tools then help bring this to your attention, to the attention of your security team. But now you're all dialed into this conference. So you've obviously been knocking about this planet for, for a little while now. 
and you should know prevention is better than detection and if you know I'm, I'm sure if you heard this from your dentist if from nobody else and security has traditionally been a detecting activity like security testing in most organizations is usually just you know one more thing that we need to do before we go live um, so we leave it till the end and then we throw it at whatever tools we got and we end up with a long list of defects and we'll fix whatever we absolutely can't do without fixing and then we're going to throw the rest on that risk register and get the approved by security nod and then we get on with building more stuff and deploying more stuff and you know going on doing the same thing so you know we know prevention is better than detection so why have organizations and security professionals alike accepted this 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 futile cycle as you know this is just the way things are like if insecure code is a big problem in your organization, then why not try resolve this before it becomes a problem? Like you can provide meaningful security training to your software development teams. And when I say meaningful, I, I mean meaningful. Like I challenge even the most you know dedicated security person here to sit through what is at best a one hour video of someone talking about phishing and talking about the importance of not writing down your password or at worst, um, what I've seen is a secure coding training that is a 10 page document that lists rule after rule after rule after rule um, and often <laughs> about coding languages that aren't being used in the organization by the development teams. So, you know, why not provide those problem teams? And I'm using the word problem here very loosely. Why not provide those problem teams with access to a, you know, something more modern, like a secure coding platform or, you know, send them to a high quality hands-on course or, you know, give them access to an on-demand course platform or give them time of work to read a book about secure coding practices. You know, don't, don't forget people learn in different ways and what works for me, you know, might not float your boat. And, um, you know, or even take it a, a step further and, you know, spend a bit more on, you know, using a SaaS tool that can integrate with the development tools and catch that insecure code as it's being written. And similarly, a CSPM, it won't fix future cloud deployments. And, you know, don't get me wrong, security monitoring is extremely valuable and nobody should be without it. And it should always be there because uh, without it, there's nothing to alert you when something has gone wrong. You're completely blind. At the same time, that something should not be a daily thing and it should not be the norm. And if this is where security is still going wrong, then moving the problem, we're just moving the problem from one place to the other. So, you know, how you escape this, this infinite loop is, you know, you have to rip off the bandaid, just draw a line in the sand, accept there is this big list of things that are already wrong, need to be fixed and define a remediation timeline that's based on your vulnerability management policies and, you know, start doing something that is no stranger to most security professionals. Now, this is a cloud security alliance conference. So um, I'll take this moment just to give you a cloud specific statistic. So 10% of all breaches are caused by cloud security misconfigurations. And 99% of those are due to a customer's fault. Now that's you. And that's me. The organizations that we work for as security professionals are the customer. So, so I'll say this again now, 99% of those are due to the customer's fault, yet secure design and threat modeling are still not things that are embraced by most organizations. And companies that have migrated to the cloud, they tend to be agile, things happen fast, while security design and threat modeling are slow because they take a lot of time. 
Now, I myself have conducted secure design engagements that lasted for weeks, and I've even worked on a single security architecture project that ran over a year. In fact, it was still running after I left that organization. So not only do these activities take a lot of time, but good cloud security architects are really hard to come by. And in fact, cloud security architects period are hard to come by. So there's a ratio of one to one security architect to say 100 software engineers. Um, this isn't uncommon. And I've worked in a company where that ratio was one to 400. And these numbers are staggering. And my point here is that there are just not enough security architects to throw out the problem if the solution is cell manual. And, and this is why organizations are reluctant to embrace secure design. And, you know, you'll say, but automation is eating the world. And, you know, yeah, shift left is now in everyone's dictionary. But that's because organizations have seen the value automation can provide in the code build and deploy phase of their software development lifecycle. But it's really rare to see this automation being used in the planning and design phase at the start. So why does shift left stop at coding? And, and before I get to that point, uh, let me tell you a story. So I attended the conference about four weeks ago and uh, I saw on the agenda that there was a panel discussion um, about CISOs. And although I'm a CISO, it, it is my first time being a CISO, so I'm, I'm fully aware there's loads to learn. So off I went to, to sit down and watch this. And there was um, a CISO on that panel, and he was talking about how, you know, security, security teams, they need to innovate and they need to move with the times. And I was thinking, yeah, 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 that, that's great. Yeah, yeah, T tell me more about that, I'm listening. And then he was talking about how their security team um, completely stopped doing uh, vulnerability assessments and pen testing. And they replaced that with running a bug bounty program. And they were getting really good results, really good findings, you know, it was a great success until the point where one of their customers asked to do a vendor security assessment of them and asked for a penetration test report. So they went back to the customer and said, well, you know, we don't have a pen test report, but this is what we've been doing. And the customer, of course, didn't accept that. So they went back to, you know, doing the vulnerability assessment, doing the pen testing and the stop doing the bug bounty. And, you know, this might seem okay to you in, in, in that particular case, it didn't solve the problem, but it was, it was the replacing the, the, this, this thinking of, we need to replace this with something else. And I think this is why companies are reluctant to move shift left, even more to the left, because it comes down to the fact that, you know, if you want to automate say threat modeling that happens at the very, very start, you need yet another tool and you know that means that you have to beg for more money for your security budget and you know that's already a really hard sell because you know selling security is essentially like selling insurance because you know the benefit is intangible day to day you don't see what you're paying for so people are reluctant to buy it and spend money on it but while automating threat modeling is not going to replace your SAS, and it's not going to replace your DAST and it's not going to replace your CSPM or your pen testing or you know any of the good stuff that we all know and love, it does allow those agile cloud development teams to not only accelerate their product delivery, but also reach you know the ultimate goal of continuous secure delivery. And there are actually a load of tools out there, both commercial and open source, that uh, do automate threat modeling. And, and sure, I mean, you know, some are better than others. The old adage, you know, you get what you pay for, it still holds true for those. And, you know, what you might not spend in pounds or in euros or whatever is your currency, you'll absolutely spend in time, you know, 
configuring the tool or you know setting it up parsing results all that stuff that need to get done in order to get for you to get that value out of the tool but like i mentioned earlier um any activity that improves uh, an organization's security posture, you know, is good and small steps are better than doing nothing. So, you know, anything that you can add to your security testing uh, tooling arsenal that will prevent the security defects is absolutely well worth doing. Um, now, again, going back to the start, um, I mentioned that I was going to share where I see the future going. And, you know, I, I don't have a magic A ball. And if I did, I'd ask for the lot of numbers and retire somewhere in the Caribbean. But what I do have is the fact that I spent, you know, the last few years of my career working solely in cloud environments. And there is things that I have noticed, um, as I'm sure others either have noticed themselves or know about through reading, you know, any of the relevant reports that come out every year. So public cloud adoption increases year on year in double digits. And I know this isn't a surprise to most people. Um, you know, companies are not only embracing the cloud, but a very large percentage of them are multi-cloud. And, you know, there's more and more cloud providers coming out, like these all these large corporations, they're, you know, they're building their new cloud offerings and you know they're being major contenders to you know the, the big three aws and azure and gcp and um another thing that i noticed over the years is that adoption of infrastructure as code usage for provisioning and managing uh, cloud environments is becoming mainstream and you know what needs to happen and where we all fall short on is that you know threat modeling and all those good preventive security activities they need to follow this trend because the fact is a lot of existing threat modeling tools are just quite not fit for the cloud now if this was an in-person event it would be at this moment i asked that she uh, show of hands have you ever used a threat modeling tool and and I'd be one of them. Um, I've used um, threat modeling tools in three different companies. Uh, so this is an in-person event. So I'll just imagine, uh, you know, a few of you are nodding at your screens. Uh, but then I'd ask how many of you have been told by that threat modeling tool that you need to set up multi-factor authentication for your root account. And, you know, have been told that for every single project that you add to this tool, even though they're all going in the same account. Or I might ask how many of you have been told that you need to ensure that your Lambda function isn't vulnerable to a code injection. And you thought, well, you know, that's a lot of garbage. Why are you showing me this? The Lambda function hasn't even been built because this is, you know, this is design. We're just thinking about doing stuff. And, and you have to excuse the AWS terminology is where my knowledge lies. Um, but this is, this is where I see the future going, like threat modeling becoming fully automated and, and really getting to that next level. Um, threat modeling should become to a security architect what web application scanning became to the web app pen testers. Like something that is there, it works really well allows the cloud security architects to get the brunt of the work done in minutes and then focus the efforts on, you know, the more complex tasks, the things that you are hired to do, the things that, you know, you really love doing. And the future is, you know, having the ability to import your existing cloud infrastructure in that threat modeling tool, rather than, you know, spend hours drawing it up on your whiteboard or Visi or whatever is being used in your organization. And, you know, getting really good threat information in minutes. And, and threat information is, um, you know, really contextual. It takes your trust zones and it takes your data classification into account and, you know, dispenses meaningful recommendations. Now, I've personally spent far too long in my career translating the remediation sections of various security tools to a software engineer and, you know, I understand you want me to enforce authorization, but what do you really want me to do here 
is what I get back a lot of the time. So, you know, to, to me, the future is also in this security remediation coming as, you know, infrastructure as code snippets. So your developers actually know exactly what you need them to do and what they need to implement in order to avoid the issue materializing in the future. And that's hugely important because in a world of cloud formation stacks and using templates, like both to avoid human error and to speed up product delivery, that information now becomes reusable. And um, like my bottom line is the future of cloud security should be going hand in hand with the future of the cloud itself. Otherwise security can't scale, I can't keep up. And if that happens, security stops being an enabler for the business. Now, unless you work at a security company, your organization's business is not doing security. It is to allow people to book hotels or order food or rent a car or, or something like that. Security is just doing the right thing. And it's our job as security professionals to make doing the right thing as easy as possible. Um, and I believe automation is going to play a huge part in this in the future. And especially, this is an API-driven world we're, we're currently living in. So we have to keep up. Um, finally, remember that not any one person has all the answers, and uh, in, neither does Google. And not one person knows all the tools out there. Um, I often hear about the next cool thing at security conferences or security meetups or, you know, just in passing, just chatting with friends and colleagues. So engage your security communities, just like the CSA UK chapter, and, you know, take advantage of each other's research and knowledge. And, and this is why events like this one are so important. I love attending them. I love organizing them. And I really love speaking to you all today here at the CSA UK annual conference. Um, it's been a real honor. And I hope that you've either heard or will hear something that you can take away from today's different speakers. And thank you all for your attention. And I'll be happy to take any questions. Auntie, uh, was great. Thank you. Uh, we've got a uh, we've got a few questions. Uh, I have right. one actually, and uh, so we we have uh, the next speaker, Abhishek, is actually in the uh, in the uh, in the lobby. Um, uh, Abhishek, hopefully hopefully you don't mind. I uh, I kind of bring you in because you know it's kind of relevant to this discussion. Um, so hello, Abhishek. Uh, wow. I know it's. A little bit sooner than, than your talk, but you, <laughs> you gave me, and when we were discussing your talk, uh, you told me a really interesting uh, kind of statement, you know, your, your thought that it's actually easier to teach developers security than to teach de uh, security people development. Uh, <laughs> yeah, hopefully, hopefully I translated that correctly. Uh, would be yeah. good to get the, uh, you know, aunties, your, your kind of, uh, uh, your view on that. <laughs> And you know, it's not a fight, by the way. You know, it's just uh, thinking. No, you know, no, this, it's this not is a, a fight. topical uh, for. for I I actually agree with Abhishek, uh, and like I said, it, it I I agree because I genuinely believe, you know, in the good in people. Like people want to do the right thing, and like I said, developers they don't want to write bad code. Um, I just think that we've been approaching this whole, you know, learning about security, doing security, like we've been approaching it. The wrong way for so long uh, it's it, we just make it so cumbersome like security training is a snooze fest in, in most organizations and there's been only one company where i was generally there was a, a notification coming in you know new security training module available and i was like i'm dropping everything i'm doing i'm taking this <laughs> training right now because they were so much fun so much fun um if anybody hasn't used them, Mimecast, I'm sorry for, for, for the ad, but Mimecast security awareness training modules, they're just the bomb. Um, absolutely. And to Abhishek's point, like coding is a skill. Like you really need to be thinking a certain way in order to be able to do it and do it right. Um, you know, I've been playing around with, with Python and, you know, other bits and I did, I did, um, coding when I was studying computer science, but I just never really got it. Like I'm doing something and I'm thinking, you know, I built a little script, you know, and I'm thinking I'm building the Empire State Building. 
but you know, an actual developer looks at it and they look at it and say, well, this is shit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, because it, security just... people are not developers. Sorry? Security people don't make the best developer, yeah, but developer no, make the best security so. people. I don't think so. There's some there's some great unicorns like um, I'm the, and these meetups again, like these meetups are, are crazy. The, these conferences are so useful. I've met really, really security minded developers through these conferences and through these meetups. Um, so they, they are out there. They do exist, but they're really hard to find. And I think maybe on your point is that they're hard to find. So maybe we should inject a little bit of security in everything, in everybody. And on the other side, we should inject a little bit of development in security because we tend to say security is everybody's job, but then developer <laughs> can say no, the other thing, right? <laughs> and, and it's the best, I think for, for me, it was the best experience to, to, to learn about empathy, to learn about, you know, developer don't, just have security to think about. They have QA, they have uh, user stories, they have an enormous amount of testing that is not just security testing. Security just happened to be one of the elements. Yeah, absolutely. It's just one thing and we, we just need to make it interesting. Like I mentioned earlier, um, it was one organization that I was actually in charge of providing security training for our developers. And it was there that I realized what works for me doesn't work for everyone. So we actually had to implement all those different things and, and all those different ways of, of doing the security chain because genuinely there were some people that just only learned from reading a book. So you had to give them some time of work um, you know, to be able to you know, take a half day on a Friday and, and go read something that talks about secure coding or, or you know, give them access to a hands-on platform. There's a few of those out there uh, that work really, really well. But we, we just need to make it interesting and forget about this, you know, read this 20 page document and, you know, we just can't work like that anymore. And, and maybe on your point, there was a very, uh, and we, we have people cheering up for <laughs> the security people should learn. Uh, I, I think maybe on, on, on that point, I think security people and developer people should have a little bit of empathy on on the business because as you rightfully say risk is a hard thing to do and business just talk about risk if you get to the board and we start talking about vulnerability or aspm or uh, orchestration too they look at us like we're alien but when <laughs> they start talking about you know risk budgets and you know uh cost of delivering something versus the cost of securing something we look at them like they're aliens. So I think that there is also that aspect when we convey a message to them, they let us do our job as executive, our job as developer, and they're happy because we, we, we are aligned with the business. So I think that there needs to be a little bit of empathy throughout the, uh, the world and not just having security people banging drums like security is everybody's job or developers saying they don't understand us. I think it's empathy is the word. Um, uh, absolutely and you know working with software developers for the first time i remember it was astounding to me the amount of things that they had to do you know it wasn't just the coding they had all these other admin things that they need to do you know in order to you know the testing and even just writing the stories writing the epics writing you know writing 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 and developers they just want to code you know all that other stuff is is extra it's not their job they don't want to do it so we, we just need to understand what it is they're doing and then try to do doing security easy for them. Um, automation, like you know, I said, is going to be a really big thing. It has to be a really big thing. Cloud, we just won't be able to keep up. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Antti. Uh, it was a really, really exciting topic, and I think we have, uh, you know, we have good comments. Um, fortunately, we couldn't... Um, uh, couldn't respond to all comments uh, due to time constraints, but uh, you know how uh, you obviously shared how people can uh, can join you. Uh, any closing words before we hand over to uh, to Abhishek? Um, no, just that it was absolutely brilliant being here. Um, you know, the main point is that like I want to leave people thinking: uh, just don't try replace stuff in your software development life cycle like there's loads of different security tools and they all serve a different purpose and defense in depth is something that we're all very familiar with but 
it's very difficult to persuade the budget holder that they actually all need to be there. Um, and that's it. I, I, will leave you that. <laughs> I will leave you on, on, on that note. Um, like hit me up on LinkedIn or Twitter. I'd love to take questions and I love talking about these things. So absolutely available for, for anything anybody wants to talk about. Excellent. Thank you Thanks, very much, Auntie. Auntie. Have a great day. Thanks very much.